Joining us is Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, former main editor of the Wall Street Journal, father of Reaganomics, best-selling author, uh, and of course, uh, worked for Ronald Reagan. And he's here to break down the economy, his take on the Charlie Hebdo situation, uh, his take on many more analysts believe 2015 is the year of the next global financial crisis. We'll hit all those points with him in the next 20 minutes. Uh, Dr. Uh, Roberts, thank you so much for coming on with us. Sure. Glad to be with you, Alex. Well, you got the floor. What do you want to tackle first? <laughs> well, it's up to you. We can talk about the retail sales report that came out today. Uh, <clears throat> you know, after being told that we had 5% um, real GDP growth in the third quarter, <laughs> we, or was it the fourth quarter? <laughs> we learned that uh, <clears throat> retail Christmas, retail sales uh, actually declined. Um, and, uh, and not just a decline in the expected amount of sales, but an absolute decline. <laughs> so clearly there's no economy. It's been obvious to any a real economist for years that there's no economy because there's no growth in consumer incomes, not in real consumer incomes. There's no growth, and there's no growth in consumer credit except for student loans. So there's no um, money to fuel an increase in demand. And since the economy is largely based on consumer demand, there's been no way to have a recovery or any kind of the growth claims that the government periodically issues. So clearly the economy is in bad shape and they're having more and more trouble hiding that fact. So we are also uh, watching a continuing drop in the oil price. Now, just try to imagine all of the trillions of dollars of oil-based derivatives. And <clears throat> when these prices come down so much, there has to be a lot of debt uh, related to these derivatives that simply can't be served. And so, yes, we're probably in line uh, for <laughs> another breakout of the um, financial crisis. How long can the QE go? I mean, how long can they keep just printing dollars by the trillions or issuing the digital money? As long as they can keep uh, the Japanese Central Bank and the European Central Bank uh, doing the same thing. As long as the Japanese and the Europeans are printing yen and euros, uh, it does, it, and the, those currencies grow along with the dollar, and so there's no relative change in the exchange values. So the manipulation that Washington is able to achieve is international, and they can support the dollar through their vassal states in Japan and Europe. So how long does that continue? I think it can continue until a large part of the world simply moves away from the dollar payment system and stops using dollars the way the Russians and the Chinese are beginning to do. So that would mean a very large drop in the demand for dollars as its role in financing the international uh, payment system diminishes. And that's when I think they would lose control. What do you make of China and Russia announcing they're going to launch a new credit rating agency in 2015? Because obviously the other ratings agencies are being used politically to undermine China and Russia. Yes, I think that's just a response. Um, what China and Russia need more than a new credit rating agency is simply to withdraw from the Western payment system. Uh, the two countries uh, have economies that are very complementary, and, and therefore they can self-finance. And so why they need a rating system, it, it, in my opinion, it's reckless uh, for the Russians to rely on Western capital or Western financial markets because they are a mechanism of Washington's imperialism. And so when Russia relies on Western payment systems, it, in effect, is putting itself under Washington's thumb. And if the Russians did not participate in this system, they would not be uh, facing sanctions because they would be independent of the system. Sure, but I mean, that's why the West doesn't respect Russia is because it's so infiltrated by the same uh, <laughs> finance systems that we are 
And, and, and globally, these corporatists, these, these crony capitalists are above the law, but they're not above the natural laws of man. And I, there's got to be a breaking point when the military has a 15% approval rating, when the public in Gallup says they don't trust the government at a record level, when we're really in a recession, depression, and they tell us everything's great. Right. Uh, when, when reality begins to set in, there's got to be some point where the emperor's new clothes uh, phenomenon becomes uh, a reality. Yes, I think the grand manipulations uh, could be coming to an end this year. We have not only the manipulation of the economy and people's perception of the economy, but also we have the manipulation of foreign policy and people's perceptions of the outside world. And I think that the government's manipulations have reached the point that they're just now too extreme. And so they may lose that their control over people's minds. This grand manipulation will be tested uh, in 2015. I want to shift gears now. You have a new article out today just titled Char Charlie Ebdo. The hypocrisy of the EU that censors so much speech. Uh, you know, now acting like they're so free speech standing up for this magazine, which I stand up for their free speech. But at the same time, hundreds of thousands have been killed in Syria after Western-backed rebels did it. They're connected to this group. What about mourning for all the Syrians or Libyans the West has killed with their Al-Qaeda proxy armies? All right. Well, we don't ever get around to that <clears throat> because that doesn't serve our foreign policy goals or Washington's hegemony over the rest of the world. The Charlie Hebdo does. See, whether or not this was a false flag attack, or whether it was a real legitimate uh, terrorist attack, the outcome is the same. Three goals were achieved. One is France has been pulled back under Washington's thumb. They're back under Washington's foreign policy orbit. You have to remember just very recently, the French voted with the Palestinians. They took a position different from the American-Israeli position. The British themselves, if memory serves right, abstained. So that this showed uh, two of the most influential European countries moving away from the American position. Also very recently, the president of France announced that the economic sanctions against Russia must end. So this is another break in the uh, uh, cooperation with Washington's foreign policy. So when you have something like this uh, terrorist uh, shooting in Paris, <clears throat> you cow the French and you bring them back under your thumb. Also, we see the uh, effect of the shooting is to uh, undermine what was a growing European sympathy for the Palestinians. This is not because the Palestinians were involved in shootings, but Muslims are generally Muslims. And, and so they're tainted by it. And also there was growing European opposition to the new war that Washington is ginning up in the Middle East against the Islamic State. Uh, the Europeans have had enough of this, um, and they know it doesn't serve their purpose. Many of them have large Muslim populations, and they understand that these populations are beginning to be radicalized by the incessant bombing and killing of, of Muslims in the Middle East. And so they were, they were tired of this and were not supporting the American policy, which was making it difficult for the policy to go forward, because Washington always needs cover. If it just goes and acts on its own, it faces uh, uh, charges that it's committing war crimes. But if it has accomplices, they can all say, oh, this is necessary to do. See, we all agree. We, we all agree that this is necessary to do. It's a NATO operation or blah, blah. And so the um, terrorist, uh, if that's what it was, the Charlie Hebdo affair brings a, a, a halt to all of this independent thinking and reorganize sure, sure. behind Washington. Well, I mean, here's a larger question. How can we as a culture be held hostage by 20 dead people when automobiles kill that many people a day in France? And it's way more than that a day here in the U.S. It's in the hundreds. I mean, since when can the media just take something and make it such a spectacle 
and then we're all shaking in fear. Clearly, whether it's staged or real, it's being used to pass draconian censorship in France and the U.S. with a cover of marches for free speech. It is so Kafka-esque. It's so Orwellian. It makes my head spin, uh, and it really makes me fear for the future of our civilization. Yes, and legitimately so. But keep in mind, the, the main effect of this is to put Europe back under Washington's control. They're no longer uh, uh, opposing the war in the Middle East. They're no longer uh, flocking to the Palestinians' cause. And they're no longer speaking about independent foreign policies. So it, it has served a purpose uh, <clears throat> whether it was a real attack or a false flag attack. And that is the main uh, effect of this. It basically means um, that the independence of a European foreign policy that the Russian government has been hoping would evolve in order to cool down the conflict and, and the growing NATO bases on their border and the trouble in the Ukraine, this has now been stop dead in his tracks because uh, Europe is now back on board uh, with Washington. So this is a very big and serious consequence of the Charlie Hebdo uh, event. What do you think it signified that Obama's people didn't basically show up uh, at the uh, PR march? A. B. What do you make of the coming prosecution of Petraeus? Well, I don't know about the prosecution, but it seems clear to me that the reason uh, Obama would not show up at the uh, march in Paris is that if the American president is there, it takes on the look of an American operation. And it makes it too obvious that France is now back in America's pockets. But if he doesn't go, and a, and a lower order person goes, or merely the ambassador goes, then it de-emphasizes in people's minds the association of what happened with American purposes. And therefore, it doesn't make um, the false flag aspect stand out. It just sort of says, well, you know, why didn't Obama come? Well, you know, who knows? But it, it leaves it without the mark of American operation. If the president is there, he is the most important person there. And then everybody gets to thinking about America or the Washington. Well, I mean, as you point out in your article that's up on Infowars.com and also on uh, your website that we're linked to there, uh, paulcraigroberts.org, you point out the total precision up front. Then there are a bunch of bumbling Benny Hills <laughs> running around in circles, falling over their shoelaces. After that, it doesn't jive. Right. It doesn't jive. We'll never know whether it was a false flag attack. It has clearly many characteristics of one. There are many very puzzling aspects to it, but I think uh, the most outstanding uh, suspicious aspect is that these highly professional killers who did such a professional military style attack, uh, uh, they escape. And they leave their ID in the car conveniently for authorities. <laughs> I mean, really, we heard this about 9-11, uh, right? Remember yeah, the, the passports passport? that didn't get burned and then magically got found that day in the rubble? Yeah, the, the passport is the only surviving thing in the two twin towers. <laughs> and so and so here we, we see that card again used. Now, the system really thinks we're stupid. Uh, I think, as I said in one of my columns, uh, they make it more and more hard to believe. And when everybody believes it, they sit back and laugh at us. <laughs> well, you are in the highest levels of government. You're in some big think tanks. I know we've had corruption in the power structure forever, but it's never seemed to be this mentally ill. Uh, and, and this, I mean, it's like Gibbs a few years ago saying, I was to lie and say the drone program didn't exist, even though it was public. There's a psychological tactic here, I think, to create learned helplessness or kind of a mass Stockholm syndrome of normalcy bias to where it's just so over the top, we just give in. <laughs> it may be, but keep, keep in mind now, Alex, I was in the government prior to the fall of the Soviet Union. And therefore, 
American power was constrained and did not have the same ambitions. But when the Soviet Union collapsed, it let the neoconservatives loose. They said, well, look, there's no longer any constraint on American power. We can do what we want. They wrote articles in PNAC saying we can take over the world. All we need is false flags. And they publish it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So what, what I'm saying is that you have to, my experience in government was a different kind of government. It was a government that was constrained. Uh, a government that basically did not want any risk of nuclear war because it understood there's no winner. And therefore, it didn't do the kinds of things that began with the Soviet class. Yeah. So that, that is a fundamental difference. There's no comparability between... Sure. Reagan and then the later regime. Well, sure. And most of our government, for all its problems, were combat vets. And a lot of them were lawyers. But now it's almost all lawyers... PR hacks, almost none of them have been in, in combat, and I really think they do, they themselves don't realize how much danger they're putting the world in. I think they're a bunch of, uh, you know, smart, focused, corrupt people, but I just don't think they have the instinctive fear they should of the power they're misusing. Well, the neoconservatives are in charge, and they want power. They are after it. They want, they want American hedge enemy over the world. That includes Russia and China. And therefore, uh, when they are greedy for power, they're not, they're not uh, bound. No, I understand. They're power crazy. Let me ask you this in they're closing. Crazy. Yeah. Let me ask you this in closing. In your gut, or, or looking at it, how are they doing? The state of the world right now in about 50 seconds. I mean, how are, they, how are the bad guys doing? Well, I think uh, with Charlie Hebdo, they've had a huge success. Whether they are responsible for it or not, it has produced for the neoconservatives a huge success. And this means we're going to see more pressure uh, on Russia and thereby on China because the two countries have formed a strategic alliance. And we're going to see a war on the Islamic State. And the, and we also... Oh, hold on, finish up on the other side. I want you to finish that thought and we'll let you go. Dr. Paul Craig Roberts. We're on the march. The Empire's on the run. Alex... Dang, this year, they just don't see how the charade can go on. But I've seen it get pushed back. I mean, I remember Roberts, when folks thought three years ago it was going to implode, he said, no, I'd give it three, four years. Well, we're three, four years later. And, and I just don't know how they square putting ISIS in charge, giving them $10 billion, letting them launch attacks on Assad, and now we've got to go fight ISIS, but then they're caught giving them airdrops of weapons. I think fighting ISIS is the cover for bombing Assad's forces. In fact, Obama has said, we need to take Assad out. That's why ISIS got a foothold. No, ISIS got a foothold because our government put them in there. And this has really woken the military up. So... What I'm getting at here is I don't see how this agenda can, can continue on. But as you said three years ago, it always continues on historically longer than we think. But then overnight sometimes these empires, based on lies, fall. Or it could die slowly. Or it could, could I guess, take the planet over if everyone uh, submits to it. So, Dr. Roberts, for about five minutes, you've got the floor. and I'll let you go. Finish up with uh, your global perspectives and where you see this going. Well, I think that uh, what's working against the neoconservatives is their neglect of the economy. <clears throat> and so they're so focused on uh, uh, world power and on the financial hegemony uh, of the United States that they're not paying attention to the fact that the economy itself is uh, expiring. And there's no growth in consumer incomes. There's no good jobs for people, not even for university graduates. Uh, the uh, workforce is shrinking in size because of the lack of jobs. The debt continues to build. Uh, and at some point, debt has to be serviced. It can't be. So I think they're overlooking the economic landmines while they are greedily chasing after power. And so this, this is uh, the hope that the economy blows up and they have no way to deal with it. You, know, you have to keep in mind that leadership uh, 
passes into empire. And empire begets insolence. And insolence brings ruin. And when you see the United States, which has now a very weak economy, challenging both Russia and China in some sort of world supremacy contest that neither Russia nor China had any interest in being part of. But this combination of Russia and China is simply too much for the neoconservatives, given the weakened state of the United States economy. So I think it is true that this could be the year that all of this blows up in their faces, despite the success that they have just had uh, with the Paris shootings. What else? I'm just there deep in thought. What else can we do as individuals, Dr. Roberts, from your historical experience and governmental experience, journalistic experience, what can we do to ensure that we don't have a global collapse, that we don't in their death throes or, or, or reaching for ultimate power all basically get destroyed in a thermonuclear war? I mean, isn't it just that journalists and people in government and media and and Every other profession out there need to realize how dire our straits are and not just be so comfortable uh, that that we just uh, abdicate our responsibility and let a bunch of madmen run the world. I mean, what else can we do to try to ensure this doesn't happen? Well, probably nothing. You know, there are no more independent institutions. I mean, journalism is uh, no longer an independent institution. It, uh, it's owned by five or six major companies. Uh, they're dependent on the government for the broadcasting licenses. And indeed, this is an old hat type thing. Ever since the Cold War, journalists have said that they have to be on the side of the government or otherwise they're not patriotic and that they are patriotic and so they take the government's side. You know, just the other day, the uh, 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 New York Times editor or former editor gave a speech uh, publicly and said that, uh, well, New York Times has to support the government. That's what we do because we're patriotic. And so if we have to mislead the people in order to support the government, we're going to do that. So, you know, where is journalism? They're, they're not part of the picture. It's a ministry of propaganda. All people can do is simply not fall for the government schemes. They have to be aware of it. Now, I don't know what any sort of resistance can come out of that. But as long as people don't believe what they're told, there's more hope than if they do believe what they're told. And I think that's what motivates me. Sure. The youth. Well, paulcraigroberts.org is the website. It's excellent. Um, we see attempts to censor new independent media. We see attempts to bring in free speech controls because the establishment understands that it is information in the final equation and truth uh, and people just r removing their consent and their financial support from the system that will force it to change. But you're right, the hubris, the insolence uh, is the stuff historically that, that causes rack and ruin and I hope we can turn it around. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Roberts, for joining us. Pleased to be with you, Alex. Always great to, always great to have you on. Uh, PaulCraigRoberts.org, again, is his site. I'm Alex Jones. InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.com are our major sites.